Well, hey there, fellow sojourners, and welcome back to Appropriating the Culture. On this edition, we reach the dramatic conclusion of our cliffhanger episode centered on the hot topic hot of topic. capital punishment. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your huckleberry today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So last week we explained that the death penalty cannot be intrinsically or inherently wrong due to the fact that God, who is perfectly good, instituted the death penalty with the nation of Israel. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the death penalty is required for every society or nation. The punishment of violating the moral laws and cultural conventions is relative and cultural. Some nations have the death penalty and some nations don't. No earthly justice system is perfect, and so while the goal of our laws is to produce a more just and righteous system, the efficacy of those laws is relative to the cultural conditions. We gave examples and explained what exactly that means in part one, so if you missed it, go back and watch or listen to it. But since we know that the death penalty is not objectively wrong, the only question that remains is whether or not its use in our culture for heinous crimes produces a more just and righteous society or not. Where we left off last week was Genesis 9-6. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. That is a statement by God that is not bound to the nation of Israel. It predates the nation of Israel, and so it has nothing whatsoever to do with the Mosaic Covenant or the Abrahamic Covenant or the Levitical Law. It is a statement about humanity. The fact that all human beings are created in the image of God, even Tom Brady, means that every human being has intrinsic worth, and so the murder of a human being is a heinous act that is deserving of our harshest punishment. Now, it's probably too much to say that nations without the death penalty are sinning, but what exactly is the biblical argument against the death penalty? God just said, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. He institutes capital punishment when he presides as king over the nation of Israel. The apostle Paul says that God gives authority for governing powers to use the sword to enact punishment. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. In fact, nowhere in the Bible is there ever any explicit condemnation of capital punishment. Obviously, injustice is condemned, but nowhere is any just capital punishment condemned in Scripture. Now, some will say, aha, what about the adulterous woman? Then they all went home. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, Go now and leave your life of sin. Well, there you go. Jesus wants mercy, not capital punishment. And that might be compelling, except for the fact that the passage is completely bunk. I know a lot of Christians really love this passage, so you might want to sit down for this, because in your Bible, you might see that this section is bracketed off from the rest of the text, and it might say something like this, The most reliable early manuscripts and other witnesses do not have. That is a warning sign. Proceed with caution. What follows is dubious. What this means is the best evidence that we have, and the evidence is pretty overwhelming, is that the Apostle John, who wrote the Gospel of John, did not write these words. The earliest manuscripts don't have it. And the early church fathers, people who lived in the 2nd and 3rd century, don't mention it. 
They didn't quote from this. And that's quite remarkable because they quoted from the Bible a lot. In fact, they quoted from it so much that we can actually reconstruct the entire New Testament, except for a couple of verses, using nothing but their quotations. They essentially had Bible commentaries, and in those commentaries, they skipped from John 7.44 to John 8.12, almost as if it wasn't there, most likely because it wasn't. The earliest manuscript with its inclusion is about 400 AD. That's about 300 years after the Apostle John died. I'm going to go out on a limb and say he didn't write it as a ghost. Also, the placement of it varies. It doesn't always appear there in John. In some manuscripts, it comes later. In some manuscripts, it comes earlier. In some manuscripts, it pops up in Luke for some reason. Furthermore, according to scholars, the writing style and the flow of the narrative does not match with John's writing. Time for a rant. I know Christians love this story. That's probably why it wound up in our Bibles. Some scribe also probably loved this story about Jesus that was circulating about, and he was probably shocked to find that it wasn't actually in any of the Gospels, and so he just inserted it. Now, I think there's probably some grain of truth in it. I think there's a reason this story was circulating around, and I don't think you have to tear it out of your Bible or anything, but I used to think that this passage was innocuous. I've kind of grown to see that it's actually quite harmful because it runs contrary to the rest of Scripture. This is the best passage to cite if you're arguing against the death penalty, but it's not in alignment with the rest of Scripture on that. Or, he who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. That's not the biblical standard for judgment and discipline. The Apostle Paul said, I'm the worst of sinners, and he also said, expel the immoral brother. And Jesus gives us the model for church discipline. Why would he bother with that if we have to be without sin first? Furthermore, this lady receives forgiveness without any sign of faith or repentance, which is not the pattern that we see in the rest of Scripture. She doesn't come to him in faith. She's thrust before him. She doesn't fall at his feet in sorrow and shame. If forgiveness of sins can be received without faith or repentance, then what is the point of hell, guys? This passage is contradictory to the rest of Scripture. End a rant. If this is your best scriptural evidence against the death penalty, it's pretty weak sauce. Even if you regard the account as authentic, it's dealing with adultery, not murder, so it doesn't answer the call of Genesis 9-6. And what's more, it could also be easily explained away as a condemnation of unjust capital punishment. After all, the law stipulates that the man and woman caught in adultery shall be put to death. And this passage only mentions the woman, not the man. Next argument. The death penalty does not respect the right to life. Okay, so apparently the idea here is human life is sacred because we're all created in the image of God. But that's God's argument for why murder needs to be punished with death. See Genesis 9-6. And the fact of the matter is the removal of the death penalty inevitably leads to the devaluing of human life. Because prosecution often involves negotiation. People take plea deals to avoid the death penalty. Without the death penalty, it starts at life in prison with no chance of parole. You take a plea deal and it becomes life in prison with a chance of parole. Norway has no death penalty. In 2011, there was a mass shooter who went on a killing spree and murdered 77 people. He received the maximum sentence of 21 years in prison. That's fewer than four months per victim. Is that what a human life is worth? When you lower the price of the punishment, you inevitably devalue the worth of human life. That's the religious argument. The more common one is, how can you say you're pro-life when you're in favor of the death penalty? Yes, it takes a keen mind to spot the subtle differences between an innocent baby and a person convicted of rape, torture, and murder, but I will attempt to explain it through the power of skit. I love berries. Oh, you love berries, huh? Yep, eat them all the time, love them, can't get enough of them. Well, how about these berries? No, those ones are poisonous. Oh, well, I thought you loved berries. I thought you were pro-berry. You are very dumb. And see. Next argument. The death penalty is not an effective deterrent. It's hard to see how a $100 parking ticket is a deterrent, but death isn't. But even if that were true, so what? Justice is not simply about deterrence. It is not just to stave off the next one, it's to punish the crime that was committed. When the entire world ends and there's no longer any option for deterrence, God will still send people to hell because a part of justice is punishment for wrongdoing. 
Next argument. Life in prison is worse punishment than death. Again, people take plea deals to avoid the death penalty. Now, some people might prefer death to prison, but you know what those people do? They kill themselves. Plenty of people have off themselves before they could be arrested or when they were in police custody or even when in prison. If they really prefer death, they'll find a way. It's not that hard. Next argument. The death penalty is based on a fallible justice system. Our justice system is fallible and a person could be executed for crimes he didn't commit. Oh no. Setting aside the fact that that's literally the premise of Christianity, the logic of this simply doesn't work because the premise is our justice system wrongly convicts innocent people. Therefore, abolish the death penalty. How does abolishing the death penalty fix the justice system? That doesn't follow logically. That's like saying, oh, there's a problem with your internet router, so you should probably toss your computer. What? Well, you see, it's because death is irreversible. But all punishment that is doled out is irreversible. You know, oh, sorry, Andy Dufresne, for all the years of your life we took away from you in your incarceration. And sorry for all the things that happened to you when you're in prison. Sorry. Here's a Burger King coupon. We good? Now, obviously, we want to better our justice system wherever we can, and we definitely don't want to wrongly convict people. But if you're actually innocent, your best chance of being exonerated is to be on death row because there's a lot more eyes on those cases. Also, wait a minute. Didn't you just argue that life in prison is a harsher punishment than death? If that's true, then abolishing the death penalty without fixing the underlying problems of the justice system is even crueler. But on the other hand, if the death penalty is the harshest punishment, then denying it for the most heinous crimes would be to deny justice. The reason for the death penalty is because there are crimes that are committed that deserve our harshest punishment that isn't cruel or unusual. And as we said, an element of justice is punitive and retributive. It is to punish. Justice is giving people what they deserve, and some people deserve our harshest punishment. Now, I fully accept that it's very possible, though very, very rare, that innocent people could be wrongly put to death. And that isn't just. They are getting what they don't deserve. But if guilty people who deserve death are not put to death, then they also are not getting what they deserve. And that is also unjust. So which do you honestly think is more common? That innocent people would be put to death or that guilty people would not be put to death? So what that means is, by abolishing the death penalty, you're trading a little injustice for a lot of injustice. That's a bad trade. Do you also buy high and sell low? Even if there is injustice in the system, abolishing the death penalty does not lead to a more just or righteous society. Next argument. Oh man, we're out of time. Shouldn't have had that rant. Uh, I guess we're gonna have a part three of this. Twist ending. Uh, send in your best arguments or counter mine on the usual social media platforms and we'll wrap things up for real next week on Appropriating the Culture.